It's a very, very uh, distinguished panel. Um, and I, for one, am looking forward to it enormously. So I'll begin by introducing our first speaker, um, Steve Keane. Uh, already well known to some of you through his media work, uh, Associate Professor of Economics and Finance at the University of Western Sydney and Fellow of the Centre for Policy Development. Um, he is an economist who treats money seriously, uh, predicting the global financial crisis as far back as 2005, which now seems a very long time ago. Steve is the author of the popular Debunking Economics. Uh, he also has a forthcoming book, Finance and Economic Breakdown, which argues that financial markets are inherently unstable. Please welcome Steve Keane. I'll do the usual ritual and see if people can hear me clearly in the back or not. Am I speaking loudly enough? Good. Okay. Uh, I'd better explain my, my uh, position as an economist is rather strange because when I get introduced to a, a, a party and people ask you the inevitable question, so what do you do for a living, I say I'm an anti-economist. <laughs> and then I explain what I mean by that. And this is one reason why I'm going to make a couple of uh, comments about why economic theory I think has been a major contributor to the fact that we're having such an ecological crisis now and why it actually needs paradoxically to reform in a direction most of you think is totally crazy to actually be able to do anything positive about it. And then uh, a bit of a comment about where I think humanity has to go in the, in the very long term. Economic theory is dangerous for the ecology because it doesn't understand economic growth. That might sound weird to anybody who's not done an economics degree beforehand, but if you've done any training in economics, you learn about supply and demand curves, aggregate supply and aggregate demand curves for macroeconomics, ISLM curves for uh, macro as well. None of those involve time. All the analysis is completely outside of time and they work in terms of what they call equilibrium. Now, as a result of that, they have absolutely no concept of processes that occur over time. And I get students in my honours year who've never even seen this, the essential mathematical tool for handling processes that take place through time, which is a differential equation. So I have to teach them. I, I basically call my courses in honours, honours economics a half a course in remedial mathematics for economists. Again, another paradox. People think it's mathematics that led economics astray. They are using mathematics that should have died out in 1870. They're using concepts from physics that did die out in 1850. <laughs> so that is one reason why they're so damaging. So I give my students a pretty basic introduction to differential equations. Then, knowing the background they come from, I ask them, what rate of growth would you be uh, satisfied with in your own personal financial circumstances? And they normally say something in the order of 4 to 6% per annum, real growth in their wealth level. And I then say, well, do you think that's sustainable? Oh, yeah. No, yeah, pretty reasonable. 4 to 6%? Mm -hmm. Maybe better than the average Joe, but I'm brighter than most of them. Usual economics attitude. So I then get them to calculate what would happen if somebody in the far distant path, to be sustainable, it has to be able to last for a couple of thousand years at least. You know. So let's imagine back at the day, the day that JC was born, somebody deposited one dollar in an account for one of those students and gave them the rate of return they think is sustainable for that period. What would they have today? And I get them to calculate it in terms of the size of a lump of gold they would have, because I want to say it's real growth. So you get one dollar's worth of real gold back in year zero. What do you have today in the year 2000, roughly, if you have a rate of growth of two, four and six percent? They do the calculation, I get them to start at 2% because I know they'll freak out when they see the 4%. With a 2% rate of growth, given the price of gold that I started giving this exercise at, uh, they would currently own a bowl of gold 1.3 kilometres in diameter. <laughs> if they got a 4% rate of growth, they'd be doing slightly better. They have a lump of gold 650,000 kilometres in diameter. And if they got the rate that they're all happy with, a 6% rate, the Milky Way would be a solid ball of gold, <laughs> abutting up against Andromeda. <laughs> so at that point, they realise, gee, maybe it's not sustainable. Now, ironically, therefore, if you have an economic theory that th thinks entirely in equilibrium, they're blindsided about growth. They don't even know what it is. And I've just read the book that people have made this partly discussion about, there are so many 
uh, the book is a good idea in very general ways, but its perspective and economics borrows so many ideas that have been shown to be mathematically fallacious within economic theory itself. For example, if you look down back the last chapter, you'll see the, uh, the uh, author talks about using a Cobb-Douglas production function as a way of talking about uh, the, the rate of growth of the economy over time. Um, that has been mathematically shown to be a tautology. Okay. And neoclassical economists don't know about it. They think it's fabulous because of the correlation coefficient they get with actual growth, actual data, and this particular function. It's a correlation with x with x. You normally get about 100% with that correlation. It surprises economists. They think it's really meaningful. They don't see the transformation that's involved. So you need an economic theory that actually analyzes and handles growth. And that's one thing I'm working on in my whole work on financial instability and trying to teach students how to think dynamically. So ironically, the most important thing you can do to an economist to get them to be less damaging to the ecology is to convince them they do not understand time or growth and they've got to think outside equilibrium to know where the hell we are now. Uh, second point, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that and I'll come back to this in, in discussions later, but the second point I'd make is that if you really care about uh, life in general, then I know a lot of people from an from a ecological perspective are in favour of a, of a low technology, sustainable living, etc. perspective. That will doom growth on this planet in four and a half billion years. Now, we know, we know enough about, about science and the fate of the universe. Now, we've been, we, we are existing roughly four and a half billion years into the life of a sun, a, a star that will last nine billion years. And in nine billion years, the sun's diameter will be slightly outside the orbit of Mars, which would eliminate all life on the planet. Now, we don't know whether we're the only life form in the universe. Maybe we are. I hope we're not. It would be a bit disappointing if we were on our own. But we'll be, there'll be one less if we don't do anything over an incredible length of time. I'm talking four and a half billion years. So the, the prospects of what we can do as a species over that period of time, if we survive the damage we're doing to the ecosphere now, and of course we may not survive it, but the ecosphere will in a transformed nature. But if we survive that, ultimately we've got to continue the technological development we've done to be able to preserve life in the universe. So I find myself at two extremes. One needing to convince economic theory to change from its 19th century way of thinking that obsesses about an equilibrium that doesn't exist, would be unstable if it did, and is wrongly modelled anyway. And at the other extreme, wanting an ecological movement that realises we have to continue technological development. Joan is visiting fellow in the Faculty of Law at the University of New South Wales um, and her research and publications primarily explore the question of what sort of relationship between NGOs and government will best strengthen democracy and be sustainable. Joan's academic work is informed by a career in which she has developed policy and advocacy for national NGOs in the areas of environment, international development, indigenous affairs, social services and consumer affairs. Please welcome Joan Staples. Thanks, Amanda. In 1989, um, Environment Minister Graham Richardson took a cabinet submission to his colleagues that proposed that Australia should reduce greenhouse emissions by 20% by 2005 on 1988 levels. He didn't get it up first time, but soon after, in the context of the uh, 1990 election, the Australian Cabinet agreed to that proposition. The Australian Cabinet agreed that we would reduce greenhouse emissions by 20% by 2005 on 1988 levels. Now, it did have a proviso. It did have a proviso that it shouldn't affect the economy. But, <laughs> but that... Um, cabinet decision I think is very significant and it's mostly been forgotten and unknown. And it represents, I'm, I'm mentioning it because I want it to represent a time when there was a dynamic relationship and a much more dynamic, I believe, NGO sector. Um, and I could be cynical and say that the victors write history and maybe the victors have written the history and have written out the history of what was happening in the 1980s about climate change. But in the last 20 years, the NGO sector, I believe, has been um, demoralised. Um, it's lost a lot of its legitimacy within the, with the public. 
And I think that we face a quite a serious situation as to where the NGO sector stands in terms of the health of our democracy. Now, I usually try to picture the, uh, the role of the community NGO sector in terms of a Venn diagram, those three, with using three intersecting circles, in which we've got one circle representing the government, all, the go all government functions, one section representing business cor corporate affairs, business functions, and the third sector representing the um, community NGO sector. In fact, one of the names for that sector is the third sector, uh, and which is actually speaking to that Venn diagram with the overlapping circles. It overlaps because there are some organisations which overlap the three. Now, the importance of that NGO sector in terms of our democracy is that if you look at, the gov at government, government will only make decisions really based on the next electoral cycle. Long-term thinking is not something that we can expect governments to be passing legislation about. If we look at the business sector, the, it's really still the, the, the bottom line. Despite corporate social responsibility, all that sort of stuff, triple bottom line reporting, the reality is that the, and often it's a legal responsibility to the shareholders, it's the bottom line. So where do we look for vision, for thought, longer than the electoral cycle? It has to be that NGO community sector. And so for the health of our democracy, it is essential that we have a dynamic, vital, active centre, set the sector there. At the, and that sector needs to be independent. It ne should not be, uh, it needs to keep itself and recognise that model of democracy in which it is separate from government and separate from business. That's not to say they don't, it doesn't um, interface with them and do things with them, but recognising that separateness. For example, at the moment within the NGO sector, particularly I think it's being pushed particularly by the social services sector, they're asking for a compact between them and government. Now, I, I believe that that's being asked for because they want legitimacy, which they feel they have lost during the last few decades. They want respect. But you don't go to government and say, respect me, let's have an agreement. You act in a way that shows that you are independent, that you have a role within our democratic system. Um, the, and I think you can actually, the health of a democracy, I think, is in the variety and the dynamic within this sector. If you look in totalitarian societies, you will find that if this sector is very minimal or it doesn't exist. So the richness of this sector is, and the variety of this sector, is, I think is a measure of the health of any democracy. So the next point I'd like to make is, the need, is, is that need for variety of voices. The importance of pluralism. And because the, the model that we need is one in which we have a, many, many voices within our public sphere coming up with many different ideas. Um, it's not that the NGO sector has to speak with exactly the same voice. The pluralist view of a public sphere also needs to have the voices of business and the voices of a whole range of, of different points of view. But public policy needs to be debated within that public sphere. It's the model that we should be aspiring to. And we all know that, you know, that, that there are other forces that operate, but that doesn't mean we sh shouldn't be pushing ourselves and trying to keep this model of many, many voices speaking in a public sphere in which pu public policy is always being debated openly. In terms of the NGO sector, the different voices that we need many different voices because we are such a society is so varied. Different sort of organisations, if we look just at the environment movement, different organisations will appeal to different sorts of people of what, the way they like to organise, the, the way in which they, the different sort of social group in which they want to pursue the um, environmental interest. So variety and the dynamism is also important. It's also important that we have more established groups but also equally important, and the value of this sector, is that new groups can pop up at any moment. You know, a local action group can put, pick up, pop up at any moment. And the climate action groups that have risen around the country are the most exciting thing that I've seen for quite a while. It's the, it's that the climate action groups and the refugee groups that popped up after Tampa, to me, just warmed my heart because I was despairing for my country. I was despairing for this sector and for the future of our democracy. 
but they have popped up. We still have people within our society that will recognise an issue. And the, the ability to be flexible and pop up like that is very, very important and must be nurtured. The, the NGOs must also understand that they are completely separate from any political party and that they don't, in supporting policies, they don't become captive of that party. They, are, they need to be able to look at the policies, in our case, for example, of Liberal, Labor, Greens, assess what's there and comment on that. Too often we have seen the environment movement refusing to say anything good about what the Greens policy is, and yet it's the best, for fear that they will be seen to be captured by that. Now, you are equally captured if you say good things about a small part of the Labor Party or Liberal policy. It's not being captured to comment on policy. And fear because, for example, the Labor Party is in power, so you're only going to have to deal with them, so you won't comment on the Greens, is actually weakening your position because it's weakening that independent role of your sector. So that's the third point I would make. Um, in terms of avoiding capture, there is a very interesting international study that was done by John Dreisek, an international uh, democracy scholar from ANU, with his colleagues. And they looked at the environment movement relationship with government in the US, the UK, Germany and Norway. And they chose those four countries over a 20-year period because they knew there were different forces operating. And I'll just speak about two of the extremes. One is that they looked at the UK and when Maggie Thatcher was there. And it was very similar to what our NGO sector experienced under Howard. And that is that it was pushed out, kept, kept it long, at arm's length, and actively denigrated. Actively denigrated. And what we experienced here was not just government denigrating it, but the arms of the conservative think tanks, tanks such as the IPA, putting out material the average of three or four times a week into our media which talked about issues which either directly or somewhere in those items denigrated the NGO sector. And the drip, drip, drip of that sort of information over time seeps into the consciousness of a nation so that the importance of our sector has been severely denigrated over that time. Now, that was what was happening under, under Thatcher. If you also look at Norway, now people think that Swedes, the um, Scandinavian countries are much more open to our ideas. They found that in Norway that there is a, a government system in which new ideas and NGO ideas are quickly taken up by government boards. NGOs are invited in to, to give their ideas and place them on, on the government's agenda. It's a much more what we call a corporatist arrangement. When they compared that with the, other, with the, with the US and with Germany, they actually found that the best place was Germany because the 20-year period where they'd looked at which also included the rise of the Greens, was uh, the 20-year period was one in which the NGO sector was not demonised, but it was also not taken in, and it was much, much more independent. So the independence allowed the core issues to actually be taken up because they were working without being taken into, into government. And they were able to identify a whole lot of issues that were not picked up in Norway because they were... <laughs> The, the, uh, the environment sector was t becoming too close to government. So we end up with a situation that if you look at the international studies, and, and the US it was quite a varied one, varied um, arrangement, because over the 20 year period we actually saw quite considerable changes. Um, but the, the, f the message from it simply reinforces everything I've been saying so far about the need for keeping your independence, remembering your role to comment, um, without being captured um, and, that that, and that doing so is, is the most important thing you can do in terms of um, democracy. Um, how am I going for time? Time's up. Please. Time's up, okay. Well, I'll, summarize. I'll leave that last one. What I uh, wanted to, to finish by saying was that um, we are in desperate times, but what we need is a an NGO sector that recognises that for climate change what we need is a people's movement which is independent. We're not at the time where we need to be in there closely relating to the political parties. 
And, and we've mentioned ACF, and, and ha I've worked for ACF, and it's valued what it's done in the past. But to actually, they, they asked the wrong question in, in asking, should we support the CPRS or not? The question that should have been asked was, what is the most effective thing that the NGO sector can do at this time to really promote climate change issues? It was the wrong question to ask. So, and I'll just finish by saying, don't despair. Um, there is always the unexpected that will happen. I have lived through 40 years of campaigning, and I can assure you that campaign after campaign, you think you've lost it, and you keep going, and Christine's phrase is that something falls out of the sky. <laughs> and it really does. The Franklin was lost many times, and something fell out of the sky. Now, I went to Tassie to organise the election in, in 87, to organise the election for the Green Independents, and we had no idea at that stage that a school teacher in northern in, in Alveston would organise the farmers there for the, against the Wesley Vale pulp mill and would agree to act as one of our candidates and was a very, very key thing in that we got the balance of power. And that was Christine, of course. You just do not know what's going to pop up. So don't despair. <laughs> <laughs> Something may fall out of the sky. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is um, Jake Wishart uh, from South Australia, a uh, student activist from Adelaide, uh, spokesperson for the South Australian Young Greens, Al Glor climate change messenger and board director for the Adelaide University Union. Uh, Jake has also been a radio presenter and budding journalist for five years with a focus on international politics and industrial relations. And in regard to the uh, latter, he is now working as a union organiser for the Liquor Hospitality Union. Please welcome Jake. Thanks very much, uh, brothers and sisters. I'll be your token young person for this morning. Um, I'm going to talk about three things today, and I'm going to keep it pretty brief because um, I was under the impression we had five minutes coming from yesterday. Um, the first one is building alliances with people beyond our existing movement. Um, the second one is political campaigning and the grassroots. Um, and the third one is supporting young people in our movement already and engaging young people that are uh, not yet involved. Um, and I'm going to start off with, um, with building alliances because I think um, we spend a lot of time talking amongst ourselves, which is really good because I love you guys. <laughs> But um, we need to spend more time talking to the people that matter, and they're the people that, that we haven't cut through to yet. Um, and I'm going I'm to tell a story about something that happened to me this year. Um, I was at an environment conference in July this year called Students of Sustainability, which is a lot like this one, except the, the average age is probably a lot lower, but it's basically the same thing. Um, and we organised to go out to um, Hazelwood Coal-Fired coal -fired Power Station, which, um, as many of you will be aware, is one of the dirtiest um, coal stations in, not only in Australia but in the world. Um, and we were going out there, there was about 30 of us um, from this conference, uh, not to smash the windows and break in and lock onto the uh, conveyor belts, but we went out there to talk to the workers um, that were out on strike, who'd been out on strike for about three weeks. Um, and they were out on strike because they were sick of being exploited by the coal company that was employing them, and they were worried about their jobs, and they were worried about the Latrobe Valley. And so 30 of us uh, dirty hippies who were camping piled off this bus and stood around on the picket line with uh, about 12, a dozen uh, blue-collar workers from the CFMEU, and they cooked us a vegetarian barbecue. <laughs> and uh, we stood around, 30 of us on one side and the, and the blue-collar guys on the other, and we talked, and we talked about um, the company that was exploiting these workers and, um, and paying them minimum wages, and we talked about um, how the same company was uh, exploiting the planet and profiteering from the exploitation of the planet. Um, and it was amazingly powerful to feel the solidarity around uh, a 40-gallon drum and cooking some, uh, some uh, veggie patties with these guys who probably, before we rocked up, thought that, you know, us in the green movement were uh, a bunch of feral hippies that didn't give a shit about workers. Um, and that is the power of solidarity, and I think that's the power that we need to tap into in the green movement. That's building links with people who we haven't connected with yet. Um, and I think unions and workers are vital. 
Um, the false dichotomy that's been erected between workers and the grieve mo movement needs to be denounced for what it is, and that is a corporate lie, an insidious corporate lie. Um, and that's just one example of how, you know, we, we have been alienated in our agenda um, and, and, it, and we are natural allies with people that, you know, have, have vested interests in jobs, in, in sustainability. Um, and, you know, we can talk about growth and whether, whether it is sustainable to, uh, to be investing in green jobs. I think it is. Um, and I think we need to build those links and, and you know, take apart the, the corporate propaganda that's been out there. Um, the second thing I want to talk about this morning is grassroots political campaigning. Um, I think all of us know the kind of change that we're seeking, seeking is not going to be handed to us on a platter. Um, and we, it's not about making the right arguments or asking politely, um, as Joan has pointed out. It's about political power and pressure. Um, and the topic of you know, this morning's panel is how does change come about? Well, it comes about through the community. It comes about from the grassroots, through people being organised um, in their community and talking to the people that they live with. Um, and I think unless we overcome you know, the vested interests that, that do not, are not interested in listening to us at the moment, um, we're ne never going to make that change. So I think what we need to do is you know, nurture the hundreds and hundreds of grassroots climate action groups that have sprouted out around the country and coordinate them into a political um, and you know, unashamedly political ca um, campaign heading into next year's election, targeting marginal seats um, like the one here in Melbourne. Um, and being unashamed about you know our political political um, you know ambitions and our and our you know we should be unashamed about denouncing the Labor Party for what it is. And I speak to lots of lots of young people about um, you know politics and climate change, and they say to me, I'm really passionate about climate change. I'm passionate about equity and poverty, but I don't want to get involved in politics because it's a dirty business and it's nasty and you know it's egotistical and all this stuff. The time the time for that attitude you know it needs to change. Um, and I'm tempted to say that young people in that, in that instance are, are immature, but when you look at, um, as Joan said, um, organisations like the ACF, NGOs who should know better, it's not surprising that young people are, are not willing or haven't, aren't used to going into the political realm and making a critique of our society and participating. They're actively discouraged from doing so right from a very early age. And that's the role of people like us, is to step up, talk to them, support them, give them the training that they need to participate and let them know that it's okay to make a political critique of their government. So um, seeing as we're in the, the, practical, the practical workshop, um, what does that look like? What does change look like? How does it come about? Um, the Green New Deal, I think, needs to come you know, down from the halls of, uh, of Melbourne University and into the workplaces and into the universities and into the shopping centres um, and the suburbs of our communities. And we need to reach out and campaign um, as a political um, group um, to the people that we haven't been talking to. Um, and, you know, that's really fun, I think. I think that's a very exciting prospect and I'm looking forward to it. And it means doing things like door knocking and call outs. Um, and stalls and vitally investing in, in, in the web, especially for young people. Um, we've seen the success of, of Obama's campaign in the United States and obviously that's something we need to focus on. And it's vital that young people are heavily involved in that process and that we're on the front line talking to people because as we all know, this is an intergenerational issue and we have the credibility um, and the dignity to go out there and say this with some conviction and make sure um, our parents who have stuffed up to pay some attention. So, um, you know, in, in summarising, I think next year when we win the seat of Melbourne um, here and we knock off Lindsay Tanner, it's not just going to be because uh, we've got Adam Bant, who's a you know, fantastic candidate. It's going to be because we were out with the community and they were part of our campaign. And we went out there like we did in the Your Rights at Work campaign and talked to them about issues that affected them. Um, and we talked to them about how the Green New Deal is in their interests and we explained to them exactly why. Um, so before I finish, I want to finish uh, on a quote from Roosevelt, seeing as it's the, uh, the Green New Deal conference. Um, the money changers have fled from their high seats in the temple of our civilization. We may now restore that temple to the ancient truths. The measure of that restoration lies in the extent to which we apply social values more noble than mere monetary profit. Happiness lies not in the mere possession of money. It lies in the joy of achievement, in the thrill of creative effort. The joy, the moral stimulation of work, no longer must be forgotten in the mad chase of evanescent profits. These dark days will be worth all they cost us if they teach us that our true destiny is not to be ministered unto, but to minister unto ourselves.